Okay, it's a joy to open up the word of the Lord with you. My name is Josh Burnham. If you've been here in the last two weeks and you're new, you don't know who I am. So this is my first week back in about two weeks here. And what a joy it is to share um, the hope and the joy of the living, active word of God. So my name is Josh, lead pastor here. Um, why do we gather? Well, we're going to put our cards on the table first thing, and we're about Jesus. We gather because of the gospel, which is simple. Uh, it's a simple phrase. We say Jesus in our place. And we're spending the next several weeks, actually this summer, in the book of John. We're calling it the Jesus story because it's about Jesus. So that's what we're going to hear. We're going to dive deep into who Christ is and what he's done on our behalf, how he took our place and gives you everlasting life. If you are new, new-ish, or if you are watching online, we want to let you know how thankful we are that you are here. So this, a round of applause here. We're not going to make you stand up. We're not going to give you a home warranty today or a, a, a new used car warranty. Uh, that's our thank you for being here in this moment. We would love to pray for you and you can fill out a green card. And our pastoral team, our church team will be praying for you this week. So turn to me, turn with me. Turn to me and turn with me in the book of John, John chapter 3. And I'm going to read this entire passage, so just stay with me. John chapter 3, I'm reading from the HCSB, it used to be, now it's the CSB, Christian Standard Bible. John 3, John is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think most of you are ready. John 3, verse 1, here we go. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him, that's Jesus, at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can anyone be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Well, how can these things be? Asked Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Jesus replied, truly I tell you. We speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is the next verse that you probably have heard before. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in Jesus is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. 
As we read this passage, let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word and illuminate our hearts. Father, as we come to you again, we ask that you would, Lord, that you would stir our hearts, you would open our eyes. That we would leave here not only hearers of your word, but that we would be doers, that we would love light. We would hate darkness, we would hate our darkness and that we would run to the only source of light, the one and only Son of God, the one who descended from heaven, the one who was lifted up for our sakes, the name of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Christ alone. Amen and amen. So my sermon today is entitled The Born Identity. The Born Identity. That, that would be a really good movie. Um, just saying Jesus had it first by the way so John 3 in case you haven't noticed is probably the most famous conversation in all the Bible with embedded in that one of the most famous popular verses in all of the Bible now let's just let's put away your religious lens really quick the most famous verse in scripture is embedded in this passage about a snake and a desert and about a man having to be born twice think about that how how odd that can sound for those that have no context of what Jesus Christ is saying so let me set the context really quick first we have two teachers we have a ruler and a teacher of Israel named Nicodemus by the way Spellcheck does not like the word name Nicodemus And we have the teacher from heaven, Jesus Christ. And so there's pitted these two. Now the teacher of earth calls Jesus rabbi, which means my great one. So that's the context, a teacher and a teacher. One asking, one illuminating. So clearly God is emphasizing something for us. Secondly, Nicodemus is the first person named since Nathaniel in chapter 1. So God is focusing your eyes and your attention upon this man. He, God is giving you an open door into his life. And there's one more thing I need to share before we begin or as we begin. It's not only the place, but the time. Did you catch what the word said in verse 2? Nicodemus, the teacher, comes to the great teacher at what time of day? At night. Now that's interesting. Because Nicodemus could have been working all day and the only free time that he had would have been at night. That's potentially true. Often rabbis would have day jobs and they would, um, they would teach or preach at night. But I don't think that's what's going on here. Because we know in the book of John that every time the, the term night is used, it does not have glowing terminology. For instance... It was at night where Judas leaves to betray Jesus in John 13, 30. It was at night after the crucifixion where Peter goes fishing. It was said about night in John chapter 11. Jesus himself said, whoever walks at night stumbles. So I think night here is a reminder of a deeper spiritual reality. It is for Nicodemus, his personal night was darker than he could have ever imagined. Let me stop there and bring that home to us. The darkness that you live in is always darker than you believe it to be true. And how much more grace would we extend to others if we really believe what is true about our sin? How much more merciful would I believe if I really could see the darkness that surrounded my heart, the darkness that surrounded the evil corners that that I have not allowed Jesus to shine upon yet. If I really believe that to be true, how much more gracious would I be to others? Listen, your darkness is always darker than you could ever imagine it to be. But Jesus knows and he provides, right? So as we look, in the middle of this darkness, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and Nicodemus comes asking. But Jesus doesn't 
answer his words, Jesus answers his heart. So if you come in here today and you're struggling or you're rejoicing and you're giving words to Jesus, thankfully Jesus doesn't answer your words, he answers your heart. And I'm thankful to have a God that knows more about me than I know. Because that means God knows what's best for me and he knows how to help me and to grow me. Even when I don't know, Jesus knows what is best. So let's look in verse 2. Nicodemus, coming at night, says, Rabbi, my great one, we know, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. And did you hear what Nicodemus says? Nicodemus says, we know. Of course, we are the religious rulers. We're the religious elite. We're the religious people. We know about you because we have seen. And Jesus is asking, do you really know? Do you really? I know you're churched, but do you really know what you think you know? Listen to how Jesus answers this. Jesus replied, so the question is, well, it's not a question. We know you're from God because we've seen your works. Jesus' question to the question is, have you been born again? Truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what sort of answer is this? Nicodemus is saying to Jesus, Jesus, I want to get closer to you. And Jesus says, we'll be born again. What? Am I the only one here that finds this odd? Because clearly Nicodemus finds the fact that Jesus offers as interesting. We're going to see shortly. So what is Jesus doing? Well, he says new birth gives sight. Now that's odd too because infants have poor eyesight. Scientists believe that, that at best they can only see a couple feet. So when you're holding an infant, at best they can see maybe your facial structures. So is Jesus saying then infants have good I say No, Jesus is not interested in uh, postnatal parenting advice here. Jesus is saying something deeper. Jesus is really telling Nicodemus, you think you see, therefore you know. That's what we need to hear in the church sometimes. Listen, you think because you see God working that you know God, but maybe you're not a participant in the kingdom. Maybe you're only a spectator. That's really what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. And Christ viciously attacks the heart of religious thinking. Jesus is saying, you think you know how the kingdom of heaven works, but you might not know. Really, he's saying to Baptist, you don't have the corner on the spiritual market, Pharisee. You think you know your words because you see. And so then Jesus begins to unwind what Nicodemus thinks he knows. And so here's what I'm going to ask you right now before we go any further. Are you a participant in the kingdom or are you a spectator? Think about the words that we often use. Well, I'm blessed because God has done all these things in my life. But what does Nicodemus say? God, we, Jesus, we know you're from God because we see and often religious people think they participate in the kingdom because they have seen God work. But really Jesus is interested in heart surgery. He's asking Nicodemus and he's asking you, has God been working in your heart? I know you see him working around you. That's called common grace. It rains on the righteous and today it rained on the ungodly. Has God worked in your heart? Do you really know? Never confuse knowing about God, about being in the kingdom. 
Never confuse knowing about God with being in the kingdom. May we never say, I know about God, therefore I am one of his. May we say, he is the great I am, therefore I see as I should see. Do you really know? Do you really know Jesus Christ? So Jesus offers in verse 3, he says, truly I tell you, Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this, this verse to us does not sound odd, but hearing it for the very first time would have been earth shattering. So in the Greek, it could have meant several things. Jesus could have been saying you should be born afresh. OK, Jesus could have also have been a saying you should be born from above. He also could have been uh, meaning in this teaching, you should be born again. And clearly, Nicodemus understands it, what? I need to be born again. And Nicodemus responds, how can anyone be born again when he is old? Anyone want to go through that process again, by the way? No. And so we understand fundamentally what Nicodemus is, is saying. He's saying, God, I don't want to, I don't want to sign up for that. How can anyone go again in his mother's womb? But Nicodemus fails to get the point. Nicodemus assumes that when you're born for the first time, you're spiritually alive. And we live in a world, still today, that we assume once you're born physically, you're born spiritually. And in the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. Jesus actually says, because of your sin, you're what? You're, you're what in your trespasses? You're dead. And so Jesus doesn't come to make good people better. That's what he's telling Nicodemus. He's saying, Bethel, listen to this. You're not half alive because you were born the first time. And, and Jesus didn't come to rubber stamp your religiosity. Jesus came to make dead people alive. And so Jesus is telling us, before you can be born again, you have to admit you're dead. Pharisee. Religious elite, you think you know because you see, but you have to admit that you're dead before you can live. Do you really understand? Are you really born from above? Now, the Aramaic actually says clearly what Jesus is saying. The Aramaic was Jesus' native tongue. And in the Aramaic, Jesus would have clearly said, you must be born from above. And Nicodemus misses it. He's asking about natural birth. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus he has a born again identity. Why is that important? Because when you're born for the first time, you're born into a family. You have an identity from your earthly family when you receive your natural birth. So how then can you become a member of a heavenly family? The same process. You must be born into the kingdom of God. And that happens only through the Holy Spirit's illumination. And in this context, Jesus is clearly saying you must be born of water and of spirit. That's, that's one and the same. He's not saying you, had to, you need to have a natural birth and a water birth and a spiritual birth. I believe that's a metaphor for baptism. Where you receive the Spirit of God when you confess Him as Lord and Savior. That's the spiritual birth that Jesus is asking each and every one of His followers to receive. So right now, are you living with your first birth or in your second birth? We're all living out an identity, right? Either you're living from your natural birth, maybe you receive your identity from your family or from your prestige or from your job or 
from your schooling or from your accolades. Those are all great things, but those are, that's identity founded in your first birth. And Jesus is asking you to find identity in your second birth. In the freedom that only is found in Jesus Christ. So which one are you living in today? Identity from your natural birth or identity from your spiritual birth. This statement, by the way, by Jesus is heretical. From Nicodemus' point of view, Jesus is saying that the Pharisees, the religious orthodox, needed new birth. Listen, if anyone was holy in Jewish society in this moment, it would have been the Pharisees. So Jesus is taking the Pharisee, the ruler of the rulers, and telling them, get your identity from something greater than your first birth. But Jesus was inviting Nicodemus into entering the kingdom of heaven and to live and out his born, born again identity. So which has claimed you? Which are you living in right now? So Nicodemus asks, how can this happen in verse 4? So Jesus jumps in into the meat of his teaching. And this born, I, I, this born identity revelation. Look at verse 10. Jesus says... Aren't you a teacher of the law? And look at the words that Jesus uses. You don't know these things. What did Nicodemus already say to Jesus? He says, we know. Jesus, we know that you are from heaven because we see and now Jesus is saying, wait, 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 you don't know? The reminder that Jesus is giving to religious people, you might not know what you think you know. And we should always come to the feet of our rabbi, our Messiah, with humility and with dependence. May we never come to Christ and say, Lord, you know I know a lot. Because Jesus is going to ask you, do you really know what you think you know? Truly, I tell you, verse 11, we speak of what we know. Jesus is pressing the point. And we testify what we have seen. What has Nicodemus already said? We know because we see. And Jesus says, you don't know anything because you haven't seen anything. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you about earthly things? So Jesus now speaks about belief, a word that he uses seven times in over seven times in seven verses. So Jesus is asking, will you believe? So let's talk about belief. Will you believe? Jesus says clearly, belief is how you enter the kingdom of heaven. And belief must be placed in the Son of Man, in verse 13. It must be placed in a person. Belief for the kingdom of heaven must be placed in Jesus Christ. Belief is the acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists. Jesus does not ask Nicodemus to accept a proposition. He does not say, do you believe I am Jesus? Yes or no. Do you believe in the kingdom of God? Yes or no? Jesus is asking Nicodemus to believe not in a proposition, but in a person. And I think one of the failures of the church, we have asked people to believe propositional truths. Is it factual that Jesus is the son of God? Yes. Is it factual that Jesus died on the cross? Yes. Is it factual that Jesus lived a sinless life? Yes. Is it factual that, that he rose again? Yes, it is. But there is so much more. We have to believe in the person of Jesus. Belief is placed 
in a person. We live in a world, by the way, that says just believe. That's enough. Believe in something that that you love. And if you believe enough in something, God will reward that. And you'll go to heaven. That's not Christianity, by the way. If that's what you believe, if you believe that belief in something is enough, you do not believe what Jesus Christ teaches and you do not believe in Christianity and you cannot call yourself a Christian. Belief is not enough. We have to believe in what? We have to believe in the person of Jesus Christ. And when you believe in him, you get something. Look at verse 15. So that everyone who believes, believes what? In him, the data, right? In something. It is in Christ receives what? Eternal life. That's, that's great news. Right? Okay. You receive eternal life. This is the first place in the gospel, by the way, that the word eternal life, this phrase occurs. Really, Jesus is saying, do you want eternal life? Believe in me. And Nicodemus doesn't, doesn't get it. What Jesus is telling us, if you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. Right now. Not when you die. Not when you're at the great white throne of judgment. You will have it then. And you will have it after that. But eternal life begins the moment you say yes to Jesus. What a glorious thought. Like God doesn't wait to give us his inheritance. Remember that verse that says the Holy Spirit is a deposit of God's eternal life in you. Some of us need to hear that because we feel like we're, we're, we're just existing. And God says, no, if you are in my son, Jesus, you have eternal life right now. I, I'm so thankful that we have that in the present tense. You don't have to wait for it, folks. It's here. It is here today. So how can all this be? How can you receive eternal life? How can you live with this second identity, this born again identity? Well, verse 16, very clearly Jesus says, so, for God so loved, some of you remembered it that way, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes, again, in him will not perish but have everlasting life life the word so is better translated this is how Jesus is telling us this is how I love you the words I love you are not are never used in John do you know how God says I love you he says look to Jesus look to the cross in this way God demonstrates his love that he gave his one and only son. The, the first half of that emphasizes the love of God. This is how God loves you. Look to Christ. If you ever forget that God loves you, look to Jesus. If you ever think that you're unlovable, look to Jesus. If you ever think that someone else is beyond the love of God, look to Jesus. And if you think by your own doing, Nicodemus, that you have received the love and the grace of God because of your effort and your knowledge and your religious branding, look to Jesus. That is his demonstration of love towards you. This is how God loved the world. The second part emphasizes the gift it is this gift of God. And what, what about the gift? If you receive eternal life, you receive it and it removes, belief removes something. It gives you eternal life and it removes something else. What does belief remove? Sin, the penalty of sin, and you will not perish. Literally, believing in Jesus Christ removes hell from your life. 
Feel like you're going through hell? Turn to Jesus. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Run to him. Find him. Belief, listen church, belief removes condemnation. Anyone so thankful for Romans that says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It doesn't say believe about Christ, but those who are in Christ. Any, anyone thankful that God has removed your punishment? Anyone thankful that the condemnation that we deserve, listen, grace is not fair. I deserve condemnation. You deserve condemnation. And Jesus removes that for those who believe in him. He doesn't remove it and wipe it away. He removes it and he placed it upon himself. Oh, what a great gift believing in Jesus Christ is. But not believing in God leads to self-condemnation. Look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. There are two types of people in this world. Those that are living in self-condemnation and those who have found freedom in Jesus Christ. Self-condemnation is like this. It's me walking into an art museum and criticizing Van Gogh for the masterpiece. How foolish of me to criticize the creator of the art. And yet that is what we do. If you have never Put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says very clearly you are walking a path of that you will perish one day and you will live an eternal life in hell away from a God who loves you. But you don't have to walk that road. There's a better way. It's, it's Jesus Christ. It's belief in him. It's the second birth. Do not live in self-condemnation. And if you have given your life to Christ, do not continue to live in this self-condemning mindset and heart where people say, don't you realize what you did? And you say, I, I have no clue how dark my, my sin really is. But Jesus knows and he saved me. He freed me. He redeemed me. And I no longer walk in condemnation, but I walk in eternal life. That is the born identity. So does Jesus really make the difference? Well, let's ask Nicodemus. In John 19, Jesus has died upon the cross. And in verse 39, after Jesus had died, a man named Nicodemus. And it's interesting, John puts it in parentheses for us. John says, Nicodemus, who had previously come to Jesus at night. John doesn't want you to forget that Nicodemus came at night in his darkness, in his covert operation. The same Nicodemus brought a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe. He, along with Joseph of Arimathea, took Jesus' body and he wrapped it in linen cloths with fragrant spices according to the burial custom of the Jews. Nicodemus, who, who went to Jesus in secret at night in John 3, was the same Nicodemus that went to the cross. And John doesn't overtly tell us, but I believe because he had to see, I believe it was in the light of day that Nicodemus prepared the body of Jesus for burial. I think it was in that moment in darkness, Jesus was a good teacher for Nicodemus. But after the cross, Jesus had become his Messiah. 
it was as if Nicodemus was saying to the world, listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave darkness behind. And I'm okay walking in the light for Jesus because it's true. He's worth it. He freed me from who I thought I was and I no longer live in this first birth identity. But I now live in this new birth from above. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've walked in here today and and you've walked in darkness and you've never experienced God working in you. You've seen him work in others. And because you see him work, you think you know something about the kingdom. You know what Nicodemus would lovingly tell you? You don't know anything. But you can. Nicodemus would say it this way. You know how you come to Jesus? You must be born again from above. And that happens when you place your hope and your trust in Christ alone. You could pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I've come to you in darkness because I believe I'm a sinner. But today I'm tired of darkness. And I want the light that only you can provide. So I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. You lived a sinless life and you rose again. And so today, Jesus, I trust in you and I will walk in light. And if you've prayed a prayer like that, if you prayed it right now, Nicodemus would say, welcome into the kingdom. Because when you believe in the person of Christ, your world changes. There is no condemnation. You receive eternal life. And Nicodemus would say, leave the old person behind. Walk in this new identity. Are you a participant or are you a spectator? So thankful for a God who understands our darkness. Even when we don't understand how dark we are, he sent his son Jesus to change our lives. And in this moment, God is calling each of us to respond in different ways. For some of you, maybe you're a Christ follower, but you you forget sometimes you're, you're living in new life. You forget that you're no longer condemned. And you just need to ask God, God, remind me of who I am. Remind me of my second birth identity. I don't know how God is moving you. I know how he's stirring my heart, but may we not miss a chance to be refreshed and renewed because Jesus is worth it. Maybe God is calling you to vocational ministry or to the mission field. Maybe for the first time you need to step out of the darkness and be baptized and show the world Jesus is my Savior. Maybe for you that's joining a local church and covenant membership. But may we be sick and tired of being in the dark because Jesus is worth it. Let's pray. Father.